Are you a podcaster? Maybe you've got that big idea and you're looking for a network to join. The multi-award winning Ozcast Network can get your content to eyes and ears all over the world. Join now for the first month free and you could be featuring this sound at the beginning of your podcast. Ozcast. Simply head to ozcastnetwork.com for details. Dr. Travis Brown, what is this medical life all about? This is the pursuit of knowledge as we learn about diseases from the ancient times to the present day. These are the stories of medicine. Dr. Travis Brown, I lost a lot of sleep getting ready for this interview today (laughs) about streptococcus because in my radio career, I was plagued by strep throat all the way through. It was every month I was on a new course of penicillin. I ended up having my tonsils taken out. It was just a ravage battle. So this is like the athlete who uh, keeps on getting injured. For For a radio announcer, that must have been the worst thing you could probably have. It is, because I love the sound of my voice so much. (laughs) Hey, it pains me to say it. <laughs> well, that's good to hear. Yeah, we are looking at uh, streptococcus, particularly streptococcus pyogens. Now, in medicine, there are a few bacteria that pretty much that, that have so, such heightened importance that that you just always need to know about them. Yeah. One of them is Staphylococcus aureus, so that's the skin golden staph. Other ones, E. coli, we often come across that bowel as a gut organism. And this one is Streptococcus pyogens. Now, I've called this episode a classical killer, and we will actually (laughs) delve into that. What bullets have I dodged? (laughs) Well, it takes us back to the 18th century, and it takes us back to Wolfgang Mozart. And... He was an unmitigated genius. Now, he was born in 1756. His father was Leopold and his mother was Anna Maria. They had seven children. One was Wolfgang Mozart and his sister was Maria Anna, also known as Nanarel. Now, they were the only two really to survive into adulthood. And there is no doubt that I'll use Wolfgang and Mozart interchangeable. I'm referring yes. to the, the, the man. He was a musical genius. At the age of three, he was picking chords on a, on a harpsichord. Oh, wow. By the age of four, he was playing short pieces. And by five, he was composing. And so by the age of six, his father was taking him to concerts, like to perform. He went to Munich, where he played at the Bavarian court. He went to Vienna at the imperial court and noble houses. By the age of seven, he was on tour with his father and his sister, who often played together as the, as the performance. This time, they went to Mainz, Frankfurt, Brussels, Paris, London. They played pieces and they improvised. Their audiences consisted of dukes, barons, Emperors, empresses, kings, queens, they travelled around 17 cities and seven countries. Can you imagine? I would have loved to, I would actually still love to time travel to hear them improvise. A, a piece at the age of seven, which is just, it's almost unimaginable to me. And this tour was, by the time, now I'll refer to his father as Leopold, uh, made he made was making the equivalent of two years' salary on this tour, and the tours, the the concerts, they weren't just in the middle of the day for these young children. It was from eight o'clock to eleven o'clock at night, and effectively, what happened was he would perform in front of these. They were it was just a remarkable sight, and the problem was one month into the tour young children and so there were signs of distress he was waking several times a night he was homesick and crying now Leopold was a proud father and it wasn't just Wolfgang he was proud of his sister Nanarol was also putting on quite a show Frankfurt August 20th 1763 we played a concert on the 18th which was great 
Everyone was amazed. Thank God we are healthy and, wherever we go, much admired. As for little Wolf Gangerel, he's astonishingly happy but also naughty. Little Nanerel is no longer in his shadow, and she now plays with such skill that the world talks of her and marvels at her. Now, Leopold, I think we're starting to get a bit of a picture of what Leopold is like, and he was very particular about the audiences he was going to play in front of. We mix only with aristocrats and other distinguished folk. But he was adamant that the tour was of benefit to his children, despite the onerous rigour of it all. In short, his knowledge when he left home is but a shadow of his knowledge now. It's beyond belief. And by the age of eight, he composed his first published music. It's called Opus One. It was a violin sonata. And again, he's still on tour. By his ninth birthday in London... They end up doing these long uh, performances, took a week long, three hours. But Wolfgang or, or Mozart starts becoming unwell. He's tired. Leopold is suffering from some angina, we believe. And Nanarel, his sister, gets typhoid. Eventually they return home. But Leopold would not be deterred. <laughs> so he continues taking him on tour. And eventually, by the age of 15, Mozart is writing operas. He's even conducting performances. And all this must have just been sheer exhausting. By the age of 18, they were touring again. All the family was touring, including their mother. And she became ill. She got this sore throat. She had ear problems. Now, Leopold refused to let her return home. And they moved on to Paris at that point in time. And her condition deteriorated. She got chills and fevers and had this almighty headache. And eventually she died. Now, it would become later that Leopold would blame Mozart for her death. Be as it may, we can see that even at the age of 18, he had already had a remarkable career as, as a prodigy. And... The amazing thing about all of this, and I didn't realise until I was doing the research, is he actually died at the age of 35. And so all the pieces that we're hearing is in such a short span, but his death is surrounded by mystery. Mm. We're actually not quite sure what he died of. And so this has become a part of conjecture. Now, the most detailed description of Mozart's death or the illness before he died comes from Sophie Habel. Now, that is his sister-in-law, albeit this was written about 33 years later. But in historical context, that's actually pretty recent. <laughs> well, that's sooner to the events than the Bible. <laughs> that's right. And so it's you know, people cast aspersions on it. It's like, well, it is what it is. Mm-hmm. And for the, it seems the last two weeks of Mozart's life, he became unwell. He became visibly swollen He was unable to turn in bed. Now, he did have some of the treatment of the day, which, do you have a guess what they would do? Um, Strepsils? (laughs) Not quite, not Uh, quite. Probably bloodletting. There we go, (laughs) absolutely, bang on. And so they did some bloodletting. It didn't help, oddly enough. Now, he was in good mental condition up until the day of his death, so there was no cognitive problems. And the physician, Thomas Franz Closet, prescribed cold compressors for his burning head. And so the day of his death, he did. He lost consciousness and then died. That was the 5th of December in 1791. Now, the physician believed this was a diagnosed acute miliary fever as the cause of death. Now, this is a fever that they have. They have also get this rash and it's called these tiny millet seeds that they talk about shapes and red bumps on the skin. We often associate that these days with, with tuberculosis, but there can be other causes for it. But even mystery around his death at such a young age, well, which wasn't unfortunately uncommon at those times, but there was there was conspiracy theories that came out that the newspaper thought, you know, a week after his death suggested he'd been poisoned. By Beethoven. <laughs> well, the, the person who actually 
put their hand up. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> the person who put his hand up to said, I poisoned him on his deathbed was Maestro Saliri, who is, I believe, one of his competitors, wow. so to speak. But it's almost certainly not true. So then a whole range of other diagnoses came out as to, well, what could have he died? And this is a historical, you know, people looking looking back at it, much like we are. Mm-hmm. And with with that, it was looking at it and saying, well, you know, could have been TB. Was it mercury poisoning? Of course, syphilis always rears its head. Rheumatic fever, kidney failure, and scarlet fever or trichinosis. And there's a whole range of diagnoses and commentators out there. But there's an interesting study that came out in 2009 by a group of epidemiologists. Mm -hmm. And they looked, and and Vienna has a remarkable record system where from the 17th century, they've kept death certificates of everyone. Now, most of them have survived. I think there's been some problems. And so they went back and they looked at all the deaths between the ages of 1791 and 1792 in winter period. And they took out the military deaths because obviously not related. But they were looking at it. They took into account people's education level. So if you died in a hospital, your diagnosis is probably more reliable than if you died at home from Mm -hmm. the person who was prescribing it. They found 5,011 people. They got their records. 3,400 were men. About 1,600 were women. And they had about 48 causes of death, but the top 10 accounted for 90% of them. Hmm. And so what were these? Well, there was TB, there was something called cachexia and malnutrition. We'd use that word today, but it was to diagnose someone who looks like they're wasting. And that could be things like cancer or diabetes mellitus Mm -hmm. uh, and, or even just malnutrition itself. There was edema. Now, edema is often associated with heart failure and, and renal failure. There was in gastrointestinal uh, problems, so things like typhoid, dysentery, colitis, and, and then there's the usual suspects as uh, cardiovascular disease, lung disease, fever. And so the clue of the, of the time comes from a contemporary source. In the autumn of 1791, Mozart fell ill of an inflammatory fever, which at that season was so prevalent that few persons entirely escaped its influence. And so this is a critical factor. What they noticed was there was something particular about these years where there was an increase of people dying from edema. This is a mixture of heart failure and renal failure, but they noted an a, quote, epidemic of an inflammatory fever. Now, the conclusion that they drew from this was they believed there was an epidemic of streptococcus pyogens at the time. And so this bacteria, untreated, can lead to complications. And these complications can be very severe. One of them is rheumatic heart disease. and The other one is renal failure. And so that can be life-threatening. So if someone goes into renal failure after they've had a streptococcal infection, eventually your kidneys start failing and you will die from that. And so they suggested that this theory that Mozart died from was a streptococcal infection complication down the line. And so that's a really... It's called post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. This damage that was happening was probably because he had a skin or a throat infection that led to complications that he died from. So it's an interesting theory. Yes. (laughs) And looking at at the span of it all, it's just, could it be? Yeah, it could be. We'll never really know. But, I mean, I think if if there's anything to take from Mozart's story, I think it's that if you want your children to succeed, you need to grind them into the ground. Oh, gee... I, th- I thought we were going to end on a happy note. <laughs> right, so Mozart's got us to this point, mm. Dr. Travis Brown. We step back, step away from the piano, and let's look at streptococcal itself. Okay, so uh, again... 
just reiterating, it's a theory. There's lots of discussions. We can always take something to learn from it. And and this is this is what we're looking at. So looking at Streptococcus pyogens, it is a gram-positive cocker, and it grows in chains. And, and what does that mean? When we've got it in media, or when we've got it in a, a culture and it's growing, when we put it on a microscope slide, we can see these. They look, we stain it with a gram stain, and it will come up this purple color. And then when we look at it, we can actually see that it grows like little bumps joining to each other. We call it in chains. And that gives us a, an idea because sometimes some of them are diplococci, so the two sitting next to each other. And so when we're looking at that, we're, we're seeing that that's how it's growing. And this is characteristic of Streptococcus pyogens. It's interesting because the only known reservoir of this is human skin and mucous membranes. So oh. we seem to be the carriers for it. And so you can't get it from anywhere else. And it's hard to know whether it's a colonization or if it's actually a pathogen. But we will actually try and get rid of it if, it, if we do find it. And it's, it's one of those organisms, again, this heightened in points, it lives to avoid our immune system. You have this capsule around it. It's encapsulated. You have this M protein and a whole bunch of virulence factors, which make us sick, but help it survive. And so this is like, we, we call them enzymes like streptokinase and uh, DNases, exotoxins, and these cause us the illness, the symptoms that we get when we have it. We don't have any vaccine against it, so we can't actually prevent, but we can treat it. And you'll, you'll notice that in medical terms, it's often used interchangeably, sometimes referred to as gas, which is Group A streptococcus. And this is because in, in 1984, there was, we're always trying to refine our diagnosis of organisms and trying to find out exactly what it is and give it a name. Well, in 1984, what they did is they used a, something called Lancefield Group. And this was them trying to separate out the organisms that looked very similar. And they would put them, this was when they separated entrococci, lacto, lacococci, and streptococci. So they're actually, we're even doing it to this day as our techniques are getting better and better. We're using genetic causes to be able to diagnose what this actually is. But when, when they were doing it, they separated, separated these into 20 different groups, and they just called group A, group B, group C. We now know some of them are individual, some of them have cells in them, uh, sorry, meaning multiple organisms, and Streptococcus pyogens is group A. And that was just referring to uh, beta hemolysis on the growth plate, that you would get this clearing of the zone. It was hemolysis on a blood agar plate, and it would just pretty much lyse the red blood cells, so you could actually see around it and through the plate. Mm. And that was what they classified it as. Is that like a moat? It's it's kind of, kind of. It looks like if you've got a little red plate that's sitting there and you've got colonies on it and you get these little clearing moat around it, then that's a beta hemolytic. And you get other ones that have this green zone around it or hazy. And again, they are different classifications and it's a different organism, but that gave you an indication. And that was why we kind of don't use it that way because we've got much more refined techniques to, to be able to diagnose it, but it's, it's stuck. And so that's where that's where that comes from, and it's often still used interchangeably because we know what it is. But the staph uh, pyogens is the most common cause of bacterial pharyngitis and and impetigo. So it can cause diseases such as erysipelas, cellulitis, even necrotizing fasciitis. And that's where. It, it, it pretty much dissolves like muscle and connective tissue in an infection. And so it's a really important disease and that the, or it, an infection. And it can cause this exotoxin. We talk about endotoxins and exotoxins. And pretty much what that means is that exo means it secretes a toxin. Endo is within. So if you lyse the cell, it comes out. Mm. And so when the cell kills, an endotoxin can be actually pretty pretty bad. But this exotoxin can cause extensive erythematous sandpaper-like rash, and it's characteristic of scarlet fever. So this exotoxin can cause a systemic effect in the body, and it's called streptococcal toxic shock syndrome. 
And this can be pretty dangerous. And it's most prevalent among young children and, and especially children who have varicella and elderly patients. And then, of course, people who have chronic disease, such as diabetes mellitus or HIV, IV drug use, alcohol abuse, or uh, cardiac or pulmonary issues. But another disease is uh, erysipelas, and this is a rapidly spreading, spreading erythematous cutaneous swelling. So this is an infection on the arm or wherever it is, but it can also occur on, this, on the face, and it gives this butterfly distribution across the face as characteristic. That's a, the appearance. And you mentioned Mozart was swollen on his well, deathbed. He, well, he was. It is believed that the everything was going around at the time. They had an epidemic, mm. so people would have got this epidemic of this inflammatory fever. And so, yes, there would have been rashes. There would have been sore throats, if the if the theory yes. holds. <laughs> And so that brings us to the streptococcal pharyngitis. And this is where people get epiglottic swelling. They get edema. They can even get abscesses on the tonsillar crypts. And they can sometimes get cervical lymphadenopathy. So that's the sore neck. The lymph yes. nodes go up. That's yes. right. Yeah. This can lead to a number of complications further down the line, a few weeks later or you can get things like scarlet fever. And this was named by Thomas Sydenham, who in the 17th century, he was an English Puritan. And so, Is there any other kind? <laughs> and he believed that scarlet fever was actually a summer disease, that the infants were very susceptible to it. He believed it was caused by uh, overheated blood oh. and that this was due to the hot summer weather. And so his advice was to stay indoors, uh, avoid meat, because that was a hot substance that you would be eating. Mm -hmm. You have some mild laxatives. And the child, if a child had this, this fever, what, they would, what he recommended was to get a hot iron and place it on the back of the neck so that it would blister the, the skin. And then this was a, a way that because it was scarlet fever might have been a head condition yes. that you would then the drainage of the fluid was an was rebalancing the four humors what is and the so, medicare <laughs> item number for that <laughs> well and that would fix the imbalance i couldn't even imagine and you could have they could have a little bit of opium as well at that point in time so okay. that, that was swings just, and roundabouts <laughs> And and this was this was what they believed it was. But we do know that scarlet fever is associated with Streptococcus pyogenes pharyngitis, and it often occurs between the ages of three and three to fifteen. And they get this punctate erythematous rash on the trunk and the inner aspects of arms and legs. And they often get it around the face, but the the mouth remains unaffected. But the skin becomes hyperkeratotic and scaly. So this is a consequence of streptococcus. And then that brings us to what, what we refer to as PSGN. And this is post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. And this is inflammation of the glomerulus, the functional unit of the kidney. And this is caused, this is a kidney disease. This is caused by the immune complexes. And what happens, so this is an inflammatory reaction. Mm. So this is the body's reaction to the infection that then pretty much seems to almost be autoimmune. It's a reaction that goes to it. Now, the risk we have of the people these days tend to be older, older patients, so over the age of 60, children between the ages of 5 and 12, males, uh, two, 2 to 1 for females uh, ratio, so more, males more affected. But you can have these epidemics of streptococcal pyogens where you just get increased infections going around. And this tends to increase the amount of people who are getting complications. So 5 to 10% of, of children with pharyngitis and 25% who have skin infections with strep will develop this post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. So the incidence seems to increase. Why that is, not quite sure. The the pathogenesis behind this is we're not sure if the immune complexes that are associated somehow get trapped in the glomerulus right. or the actual antibody itself targets the basement membrane of the glomerulus. And so this is, you know, it doesn't really quite matter, but that's our understanding of how we think it, it occurs. Fortunately, most children 
90% will recover and it's not a problem, but for older patients, it can be a cause of serious illness. And the challenge with this is everything ranges from the patient can be asymptomatic to get what we call a markedly acute nephritic syndrome. And this is a mixture of hematuria, so blood and urine, proteinuria, which it tends to be mild to moderate, but it can be very severe. So you're losing protein in your urine. They can become edematous. They'll have hypertension and increased creatinine, meaning that their kidneys are becoming a little bit overwhelmed. And it is more common in skin infections. And this tends to happen 10 days to two weeks after either scarlet, scarlet fever or pharyngitis. And that brings us to the last complication, which is a really significant one, and that's acute rheumatic fever. And this is, happens two to four weeks after, often after a pharyngitis episode. And the, we're not going to get into it today. This is because there's a whole criteria about how acute rheumatic fever is diagnosed. There's major and minor criteria, too, of this one. It's a combination. But it's often thought that the M protein that the streptococcus has in it and T cells somehow cross-react with heart proteins. And so again, it's, a, it's a, almost an autoimmune response or a delayed response for your immune system that somehow the proteins are very similar and then you get mixed up with streptococcus and self, self proteins. Mm. And so this causes significant cardiac disease. And, and this is why it's so important to know about in medical terms. we had that break, Travis. Now I'm wondering if I spent most of my radio career with undiagnosed scarlet fever. <laughs> Hopefully not. <laughs> but look, the the fortunate thing in, in, in the final act of, of all of this, the, the fortunate thing is this is a organism we're very familiar with dealing with in the lab. I think clinicians are actually very familiar with it in dealing with with it, uh, patients coming in. It's always a good reminder of how important it is. And then yeah. the, the other part with it all is in some of the tertiary settings, it's also important to know as a differential diagnosis just to either rule it out or even just think of it sometimes. And this is the we, we do. We root, This is an organism that is routinely identified. We put it on the respiratory bench. We'll always be looking for it and we'll always report it if it's come, come across it. Because scientists uh, are taught to recognize it and identify it. And we will report sensitivities. The fortunate thing about streptococcus is it's very sensitive to penicillins. And so there are alternatives if someone has a, a reaction to penicillin. We'll keep preface that with... Uh, often people don't think a reaction, the penicillin reaction, isn't a real reaction. Somebody, <laughs> so, well, we talked to our immunologist, Damien Langarth, and uh, he was saying for the vast majority of people, they don't have a real penicillin allergy uh, that, that warrants them avoiding penicillin. And this is one of those areas really make sure if it's an anaphylactic reaction and it's happened uh, you know, recently, then yes, they, they probably do. If it's something that happened 20, year, 20 years ago when they were a child, chances are they actually don't have it. But there are alternatives. Kephlosporins uh, are useful, but you can also use macrolides such as azithromycin and, and clarithromycin. Uh, an alternative is also there is clindamycin. So we do have a range of antibiotics to, to treat this, and it's very treatable. There's also a test. I've never used it myself. I've never come across it. People will be familiar with it, uh, with with the type of uh, test that it is. It's the rapid streptococcal antigen test. And so someone can take a swab and you can, again, look at it and see. They're available, but uh, I've not used them myself. But remember, if someone is presenting with with complications of a group A streptococcus. So if someone's got a, a sore throat, pharyngitis, take a swab, send it to us. It's very easy to be able to detect streptococcus pyogens and, and manage it there. But if someone is able, is presenting with what you think might be complications, so the post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis or acute rheumatic fever, 
searching for the organism is pretty much uh, not useless, but it's it's the yield's not going to be that much. And that's because they've already had the infection. Yes. That's the yeah. horse has bolted. <laughs> that's right. So you're looking at it. So the most useful thing to know about is serology blood tests because we can look for the antibodies in in these instances. And the two antibodies that are relevant, one is called anti-streptolysin O, which is abbreviated to ASO, and the other one is anti-deoxyribonuclease, so DNA, B, so ADB. And and the the challenge with this, though, so these these antibodies are, are very useful to detect. The problem is... They're so prevalent, like in healthy school age children, because they always are coming across this organism constantly. And so, just testing everyone for it wouldn't be useful because you detect a whole bunch of kids who have it. And it's always hard to know what does, what does that mean. But we also know that from the complications tend to be in isolated instances. And the majority of people who have pharyngitis and skin infection don't go on to produce these complications. And so it's important to know, but remember, if you have the wrong test at the wrong time, it can be dangerous. But if you have the right test at the right time, it can be invaluable. So if you're looking at someone who you think has streptococcal complications a few weeks down the path, consider serology and, and, The important thing about this is the ASO, so the uh, anti-streptolysin O antibody, peaks about three to five weeks after an infection. And so that tends to be uh, often a few weeks into the complication. So if you test it at that point in time, you might find it increasing. The other one, the other antibody, ADB, peaks at at six to eight weeks. So the whole point behind it is if you catch it early enough and you're seeing the initial parts of the complications a few weeks after it and you think to test it, you might find that the antibodies are high or when you do repeat testing, you might find that it's increasing. And that's the whole point behind this is that if you find it, treat it, manage it, manage it as you well. You'll have someone with you know, streptococcal uh, infection treated. It's it's managed. If you have someone with complications, consider the serology when you, and at the initial point and then two weeks later repeat it because what we can tell is the antibody levels, first of all, ASO peaks within three to five weeks, mm-hmm. ADB peaks within six to eight weeks, and then they pretty well rapidly drop off up until about six months, and then it slowly declines after that. Now that you know that, you can actually see, even if someone's got it detected, you detect it at the initial point and two weeks later, if it's hardly changed at all, if it's just that it might be a long-ago infection and probably not the diagnosis. So it's just about managing the test, knowing what the results are if it's acute, or knowing what the results are if it's not. And in a beautiful, musical, poetic way, if we think of that antibody ASO, it also stands for the Adelaide Symphony Orchestra, who do play Mozart often, and thus we bring this episode to a climactic end. This Medical Life is recorded in the Talked About Marketing Studios in Adelaide. For show notes and more information about the podcast, visit thismedicallife.com.au. You can contact the hosts via Twitter. Dr. Travis Brown is at Dr. Travis Brown. That's DR for doctor. And Steve Davis is at Steve Davis. Editing and production is by Tim Whiffen. Design is by Tom Buzzenjutt. This has been a Pathnotes Proprietary Limited production. Life is uncertain. It's okay to feel stressed, anxious, worried, or frustrated. It's normal. 
With CalHOPE's free and secure mental health resources, it's easy to get the help you and your loved ones need when you need it the most. Call our warm line at 833-317-4673 or live chat at calhope.org today. Are you a podcaster? Maybe you've got that big idea and you're looking for a network to join. The multi-award winning OzCast Network can get your content to eyes and ears all over the world. Join now for the first month free and you could be featuring this sound at the beginning of your podcast. OzCast. Simply head to OzCastNetwork.com for details.